So there are definite human limits to survivability of temperature and humidity. And the physiology of the human body basically sets those numbers at theoretically 35 Celsius with 100% humidity. But the actual data, experiment trials on people, very, very healthy young people, show that it's not actually 35, it's closer to 31 or 32. another climate emergency forum today it's too hot to handle that's right we're talking about the wet bulb temperature what you may be asking is the wet bulb temperature oh you may have been hearing about it as well because it's been in the news a lot lately so i'm just going to give you a little bit of an intro of the wet bulb temperature versus dry bulb versus heat index which I know that most of you are familiar with the heat index. So what the heat index measures is it's, it's calculated for shady areas and it takes into account two factors, the temperature and the humidity. So where I'm from originally, which is Houston, people would say over and over again, it's not the heat, it's the humidity, right? I, I hear that they say that in down in South Florida as well. Well, we all know on some kind of level that humidity does make heat more difficult to bear. And what wet bulb temperature measures is the heat and direct sunlight. And it does take into consideration the temperature and the humidity, but also wind speed and sun angle and cloud cover. It's a lot of factors that go into this. Basically, the wet bulb temperature is making survivability and the heat more difficult in regions that are already historically hot. For example, in India and Pakistan, I've been reading recently that people in India, which is a largely agrarian society, there's a lot of subsistence farmers, and a lot of them are suffering, are falling out in the field, so to speak due to this very, very high wet bulb temperature. This is also, as I mentioned, happening in Pakistan. The heat is so hot that the human body really is just not capable to keep up with it and cool itself off because we sweat, right? And when we sweat, that perspiration on our skin, when it dries off, it has a cooling effect. But with this rising wet bulb temperature, it prevents that form of cooling for us. And, and I can tell you, I'm, I'm very familiar with this. As I mentioned, I am from the South here in the United States. And I remember I used to go to the French Quarter a lot. And for many years ago, they instituted, thank goodness, I still think it's too cruel, but they instituted a policy for the, the carriages in the French Quarter, where up to a certain degree of heat, but also with a measure of the humidity, the horses aren't allowed to carry tourists around the French Quarter because they could literally just collapse and die. This is terrible. And coming from Texas, as I do, football is a huge sport. It's a big sport. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was a student who was practicing, as you see, if you drive anywhere along the interstate, these football players practicing after school, you know, doing football practice. And the wet bulb temperature was so high that uh, one of these students actually died. And you can imagine with all the gear and the clothing, the helmet, and then this wet bulb temperature, it's just so additive. So it's something that we're going to hear more and more of. It's something that truly does threaten all mammalian species, including humans. Uh, the good thing about humans is we can get into a building and cool ourselves off with air conditioner. Other mammalian species aren't so lucky. So I do want you to bear in mind, while we're probably talking about how this affects humanity, it will affect, of course, all other forms of life as well. 
And I'm going to pass it on over to Paul because he can really speak to the nitty gritty of the science behind this phenomena. So Paul, can you break this down for us a bit more? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Regina. So most people remember the temperature 98.6 Fahrenheit as being the core body temperature. If you stick a thermometer under your lip or under your tongue rather in your mouth and measure your core body temperature, you get 98.6 Fahrenheit, which converts to exactly 37 degrees Celsius. Now, it's a bit cooler on the surface of your skin. It's two degrees Celsius cooler, in fact. So the skin temperature is typically, for humans, is 35 degrees Celsius. So when the outdoor temperature, the environment that you're in, is at 35 degrees Celsius, and is fully laden or saturated with water vapor, so it's got 100% water vapor, then, you know, it feels very stifling to your body, but, you know, and you, you're going to sweat like crazy, but because the air is fully laden with water vapor, it can take no more water vapor, so the sweat on your skin will not evaporate, and it's evaporative cooling that is the key thing that allows our cells to cool down. So what happens as a result, if we're in those conditions for hours at a time and not very many hours, well, the body is not able to throw off heat in those conditions. So the core body temperature rises and you then get heat exhaustion within several hours. And, and, then, and then you get heat stroke and you're basically dead within about six to eight hours in those conditions. That's the theory. Now, it's amazing to me, but that wasn't experimentally tested with actual humans very much at all in the past. It's very difficult to find experiments on that. That's a theoretical number based on core body temperature. But there was a study that was published, and uh, I did a whole separate video on it on my channel. I think it's at Columbia University, where they looked at 24 healthy uh, young people, more or less a split between male and female. These were young guinea pig, or rather graduate students at Columbia, I'm sure. They were put in a room where the temperature and humidity was controlled. They had um, light to moderate exercise. They were on um, stationary cycle cycling equipment. So they were putting out some energy, you know, sort of moderate, an amount of moderate amount of energy that you would get just walking around, et cetera. And what they found out is that nobody in that study could withstand 35 degrees Celsius. In fact, it was about 31 degrees Celsius with 100% humidity uh, when their core body temperature started rising. Now they, were in a lab in a controlled environment and they had sensors on their bodies, many sensors on the skin at different places. Also, they had ingested a transponder which continuously monitored their core body temperature and transmitted it to a radio receiver on the computer. So it was a very detailed study and concerningly enough in the study, the actual practical resilience of, of the human body was even much less than 35 degrees C. Now, more work is going to be done, more research needs to be done because we know that as people get older, their tolerance to high heat and humidity actually decreases. We also know that there's lots of different medications, for example, antidepressants, et cetera, that actually reduce the resilience of the human body to be able to cope with those temperatures. So all of these factors are very concerning uh, because the practical numbers seem to be much more important and much different from the theoretical numbers. And we're reaching those limits. In fact, we've surpassed those lower limits, the practical number limits in many places like the Middle East next to oceans, for example, when ocean temperature is 32, 33 degrees Celsius, and you're right on the coastline, you're seeing those wet bulb temperatures. Thanks so much. Um, and just a quick point, just a quick question. When you say 100% humidity, like for me, I envision a steam room. What does that actually look like? 
Well, the air is only able to have so much water vapor content. So 100% humidity is the air is fully laden with as much water vapor as it can hold. Any more water vapor, and you start getting uh, condensation and, and misting. So if you are at 100% humidity at a certain temperature, if you raise the temperature, then the air has more capacity to hold more water. So that 100% number would, would drop. And if you lower the temperature when you're under those conditions of saturation, then water vapor would start forming You'd get in, in the air. You'd get some sort of fog sort of thing happening. So for any given temperature, the number, the 100% the humidity is achieved. Well, that saturation number that changes with temperature. I see. So it's temperature dependent. Um, thank you for that. And I want to turn it over to Peter because I'm interested to hear what type of uh, health effects this can have. I mean, I touched on just the very surface of it. Is there anything that you can share with us about this, Peter? So um, one really important thing, as Paul already has alluded to, is that the wet bowl temperature intolerance, um, this affects young people, right? We're used to hearing, you know, extreme heat, obviously older people, um, small baby children are, are most vulnerable. But on the wet bulb temperature, when it gets to that, when you've got humidity going as well as the uh, temperature in a heat wave, it's everybody. So that's really important. So the um, the paper that really got my attention was written by, and he's written two great papers on wet bulb temperature, Fahid Sahid. And he published a paper uh, last year that said, dead, it, it was titled, Deadly Heat Stress to Become Commonplace Across Southeast Asia at 1.5 Degrees C Warming. So we're talking about tens of millions at least of people. On the, uh, on the health, I think it's, as Paul has already mentioned as well, it's the um, agrarian people, the workers, and Africa. Now, Africa seldom gets mentioned on this issue, but they're very vulnerable because um, a complication of this, of course, we've already seen. It's a deadly com combination. Today, yesterday, at the moment, Japan is in a heat wave. This is the most severe heat wave that Japan has ever had, ever. And um, this means that we have unprecedented heat waves right across the Northern Hemisphere, right across. Unprecedented early. And, of course, our scientists have yet again said that this has occurred decades before they had expected we're going to be at 1.5 degrees C by 2030. No matter what you hear from scientists, policymakers, governments, we're going to be there. So um, at 1.5 degrees C, India is going to be in terrible, terrible trouble, particularly as has already been mentioned, particularly because there's so many agriculture in India is particularly dependent on, on labor. In places, it's changing, but it's still... So they're in a, in a huge food security problem, already, already committed. If we don't put our emissions into decline in a few years, our emissions are uh, going to be increasing faster than ever over the next few years, right? Everybody's going back to coal, We've got a horrible war on, right? Fossil fuels, um, it's just horrendous, people, absolutely horrendous. Um, that means that we are going to be at 2 degrees C way before 2050, way before. So another paper, another scary headline. I hope people get scared by this stuff, you know, really. Headline, uh, this was an American paper. Large swaths of the tropics and beyond will see crushing combinations of heat and humidity in the coming decades. This is going to happen. Now, what's happening in Japan, of course, is that sales of air conditioners have rocketed out of sight. And of course, the Japanese government is telling people, you know, not to use electricity for unnecessary reasons, switch your lights off, but you must use your air conditioners for your health. So there's the deadly lethal combination, right? Heat 
humidity and air conditioning as the only response that we have. I don't know what we're going to do. And scientists, uh, and, and I mean um, governments, policymakers, they certainly don't have a clue about what we're going to do. But I think we've got to face, we're, we're in for a hell of a huge, huge problem. Terrible, terrible, terrible. At 1.5 degrees C. Yeah. Thank you for that, Peter. And I, I really appreciate that eloquent demonstration of the positive feedback loop. It's hot. People need relief. They turn to AC. Of course, all of these AC, millions of air conditioners go, you know, it's terrible, terrible for the environment. And of course, further contributes to heating and it just continues and continues and continues. It's hard to find a way out. And yes, yes, we, we're definitely gonna pass 1.5 and way before 2030. This is what I've heard, 2026 being the crossing point. Paul, is there a way out? Well, we can uh, wear chill suits. People working outside will need to wear a suit that uh, cools their body. You know, a little, little pump, maybe uh, glycol cool, glycol circulated. There's an Indian company that has developed a very interesting suit using thermoelectric coolers. So it's just, you have a battery, you put a current through this thermoelectric cooler device, TE cooler for short, or also called a Peltier cell. And it has a hot surface and a cold surface and the cold surface is next to your body and it cools your body. These will become vital for people working outside. And, uh, you know, as these things are mass produced, the price should come down, but companies will have to give them to their employees. I mean, they've already shifted, uh, you know, most work on um, outdoor projects in India in summertime, uh, you know, very warm conditions are done. The work is all done at night, at least it's a bit cooler, you know, and people will sleep during the day. But interestingly enough, a fiction book by Kim Stanley Robinson just came out a few years ago called Ministry for the Future. And in the first chapter, we have a scenario where there is a massive heat wave in India combined with high humidity and that and it kills basically millions of people in this fiction book. So, you know, as the world continues to warm, unfortunately, we're heading closer to making that type of scenario a, a nonfiction event, make that type of scenario occurring. So there are definite human limits to survivability of temperature and humidity. And the physiology of the human body basically sets those numbers at theoretically 35 Celsius with 100% humidity. But the actual data, experiment trials on people, very, very healthy young people, show that it's not actually 35, it's closer to 31 or 32. Of course, older people will be even lower and the very, very young, as Peter mentioned, will also be lower because babies do not have the ability to sweat. So their, their heads actually act as a bit as radiators and you know faces will turn bright red. You know, if they're overheating, they don't have the ability to sweat um, at, at the very young, at very young age until they get to a bit older. So we're, we, we have these hard and fast limits. So we're going to have to recognize and there'll have to be warning systems in place in cities that when the wet bulb exceeds safe limits, then people need to stop working, get inside, get air conditioned. Ning, um, drink lots of water. One of the problems with the human body response to these type of temperatures and humidity are that as you start going into heat exhaustion, your, it affects your brain, it affects your thinking, and it saps your energy. Quite often, you don't recognize that this, could, this is going to become a fatal thing for you. So if you, you know, an old person in an apartment building, if they're not checked by somebody, if, if there's no air conditioning, um, once they have heat exhaustion, then they don't have the ability to extract themselves from the building 
before heat stroke sets in and they and they die. If they're told, fill uh, you know a bathtub full of cold water, immerse yourself in there as soon as you start feeling faint, or go to a cooling center nearby, or people could have bracelets. Uh, the Fitbits could monitor their body vitals, and when there's a problem, it could send a signal to uh, to some center and. Uh, you know, they could pick up that this person's going to be in trouble. I mean, there's lots of things that we can do. The first massive heat wave that hit Chicago, there were huge numbers of fatalities. They had some other events that were just as bad, but very, very low fatalities because the city had methods to reduce the fatalities. Thank you for that. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds dystopian, this whole notion of the chill suits. But uh, I understand, you know, if, if I, I see you guys working construction on the highways and they're on a black surface, which pulls in the heat and they're out there for hours, my first thought is, well, we have these billions of people, if they all need chill suits, how many of them are going to end up in the ocean? And it's just further waste. And then, of course, they are expensive. And I'm just wondering, Dr. Carter, are there cheaper ways i've seen i've seen people who put like um a handkerchief or a towel and they make it wet and they wear it is that something that can protect us from these rising wet bulb temperatures nothing's going to protect us from the rising wet bulb temperatures or the increasing severity and length duration of the heat waves until we have all fossil fuel energy 100% replaced by clean, renewable, everlasting energy. Because otherwise the CO2 is going to keep on piling up and temperatures, heat waves, wet bulb, horror stories, they're just going to increase and increase and increase. Um, that's the bottom line, right? That's the absolute bottom line. Um, you know, the scientists, they had this fixed sort of rule years ago that I remember. When people start bringing up adaptation, the scientists said there's no adaptation without mitigation. So we're in the problem now that I must say that most of the scientists are sort of, um, of course, they're all researching adaptation. That's why. So it's very rare, actually, for me to read a paper on for instance, uh, actually, this paper on Southeast Asia was one of the few that at the end of the paper said, in addition to adapting, we've really got to get our emissions down fast. So uh, one of several reasons why I like that paper, but you very rarely hear that. So that's the bottom line. The bottom line is to stop burning fossil fuels. Otherwise, everything is going to get worse and it's going to get worse faster. I, I don't think that that that's going to happen. And I think you're probably know that that's not going to happen as well. This is my guess. We always hear that the global North is going to be spared the worst. It's a horrible thing to think, but what you're saying is even that's not true. No, we've got unprecedented heat waves right across the Northern hemisphere everywhere this year. Every couple of years, it's going to be worse. Yeah, I mean, don't forget that um, we're not in an El Nino year. When an El Nino year comes along, then add another 0.3 degrees Celsius to the global average temperature. And that doesn't sound like much, but that will exacerbate everything that we're experiencing now. We're, we've been in a, the opposite phase to the El Nino called the La Nina. So that's caused some cooling, believe it or not of the you know this year and and last year and and the, the a little bit the year before so when that phenomena ends and we're in the opposite phase the the el nino it's it's going to be horrifying the records that, that will be set it's, it'll be something we haven't experienced before so we've had a few years of la nina are we expecting to see an el nino next year uh, according to NOAA, the odds of an El Nino are about 50% within the next five years, because they say that within the next five years, we're certainly going to blow through the 1.5 with 50% uh, probability. That's what the NOAA, the, the U.S. government, NASA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA report has, has said. So that holds quite a bit of weight. 
I think what's really important to say here is when all of these regions become uninhabitable, whether it's due to uh, famine, drought, rising wet bulb temperature, all of these people are gonna have to go somewhere. Here in the States, I, I'm not sure if you heard the news, but just a few days ago in San Antonio, there was a truck found filled with dead bodies. Speaking of incredible heat, there was no AC, no kind of aeration or anything in the back of this truck with over 50 bodies. So it seems to me that what you're both saying is we're just going to have more and more of that, which of course will lead to more geopolitical destabilization. I hate to get doom and gloom, but we can't provide chill suits for everyone. And even if we could, I mean, it's a horrible dystopian answer and it's not going to happen. <laughs> we can't even provide food for people. So we've talked a lot about how this is going to affect the rural and especially the rural poor. I'm living here in New York City, and I got to tell you, I'm over here by the park. And when I move up to Broadway, the heat is just so different, you know, that there's not that trees. And I'm, we're talking about the heat island effect. And I'm wondering how this will merge with um, and, and impact the wet bulb temperature. Do, do either of you have something to say about that? I'm sure you both do. So I'll start with Peter and then move on to Paul. Well, yeah, it's just going to make it a heck of a lot worse, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're talking about an extra several degrees, and, and it's not just the cities. It stretches way out. And we've known about this, and scientists have warned about this for many, many, many years. But yeah, the urban heat island effect is going to have a, um, again, it's going to have a, an accelerating effect, right? Because it's compounding. But I've heard Paul talk about this, and he knows a lot about it. Paul? Yeah, well, the uh, the larger the city, the the stronger the effect can be. So for, uh, you know, a million odd people it might be one degree rise. So the urban area will be about one degree hotter than the rural areas surrounding the city. You know, as the city goes higher and higher population, two million, three million, five million, you can get uh, easily, you can get a three degree temp Celsius temperature rise within that city. But generally, people in the cities have the ability to uh, have air conditioning, and air conditioning is actually quite vital. So this is why, you know, imagine a power failure during a heat wave. The things can cascade. So let's say we're in a heat wave and we're in a massive drought. So the river flows decrease, the water temperature of the rivers increases. So nuclear power plants that are on the river can no longer be cooled from the river water. So they have to throttle back or shut down. So then there's rolling power blackouts and then the air conditioning goes and then you get the cascading effects uh, where you know, many people would be at risk without their air conditioning on, on these, during these heat waves. So uh, yeah, the urban heat island makes the cities much warmer as long as people there have air conditioning, then they don't really notice so much or their, their lives aren't threatened. But with a power failure, the, everything would change, of course. So also, um, there are feedback loops within large urban centers because with such a high density of people living there and many, many people, you know, in apartment buildings and houses and every, you know, uh, companies, they all have these air conditioning units. So the air conditioning units are basically transferring the heat from inside the building to the outside of the building. So they're actually lowering the temperature inside the building, but they have the effect of warming the air in the local region around the air conditioning unit on the outside of the building. So if there's a high density of say apartment buildings with all of their air conditioners st sticking out every windows then it makes the outdoor temperature near that region even warmer so this is a feedback effect and it also for people that are for example living on the street and don't have access to air conditioning they're actually directly suffering from all of the people that are running their air conditioners in their uh, apartments or, or houses it seems there's so little we can do in this situation to take care of ourselves that doesn't affect others negatively. It's, it's quite the conundrum. So I know that we've talked about adaptation and mitigation 
Uh, what are some pretty simple things I'm hoping that we can do to mitigate at least the heat island effect? Is there anything that we can do? So there's a lot of talk about um, artificial albedo um, out in, <laughs> in space and stuff like that. Okay, but it's really strange that um, we're not we're not doing it on the ground, right? I mean, the heat island effect is because everything's black, right? You know, our buildings are dark gray, or roads are black, and uh, <laughs> the uh, car parts and everything are black. So um, albedo, you paint white over the black instead. And, and there's a, an experiment being done successfully. A community somewhere in Spain, I remember reading about, they decided to paint all their roofs white and see what happened. And it was cooler. But the big thing, big thing, is to force our governments to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. That's the big thing. And that has an immediate beneficial effect all around. So there you have it. You can paint the tops of your buildings white. I, you know, I want to encourage my building to do something of that effect, but don't leave out fighting against the continued combustion of fossil fuel. We need many, we need a many pronged attempt to fix this situation that we've put us in. And we can do it. You can do it. We can all do it. If we just do one little thing each day, convince our boards of our buildings to paint the, our buildings uh, rooftops white, use fans instead of AC. That's what I try to do. Whatever it is, if we all rally and try to do something, it can't amount to nothing. We need to maintain hope. And that's what we hope for all of you. So thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum. And if you've not done so yet, please be sure to subscribe. It really, really helps us. And if you have anything that you'd like to add that you think that can help with the heat island effect or mitigating the wet bulb temperature, leave a comment. It really helps with the algorithm. Share this video and we'll see you next time.